One of the great things about being a food plotter as opposed to a professional farmer is I don't have to concern myself with things like profit or yield and I can afford to experiment and just see what happens. So that's what I'm going to do in this field right here. What you're looking at here is about a 10 acre field uh, that this past fall I planted in wheat and crimson clover. Had a great stand. The crimson did really well. It's all gone to seed now. The wheat's done really well. You can see it's still standing here. It's gone to hard seed. It's doing really well. So my experiment is to come in here with buckwheat and uh, sunflowers, drill directly into it, with the idea being that the buckwheat and the sunflowers can take advantage of some of the nitrogen that might be left over from the crimson clover and uh, also provide living roots in the field all summer. I also think, and part of my scheme is, that the buckwheat could go to seed two, maybe even three times during the course of this summer. It, it goes up so fast, it grows so fast, it'll be up in a month, flowered, go to seed, drop the seeds, uh, first rain comes along, it'll sprout again, and it'll do that two or maybe even three times between now and say August. At which point in time, what I'm hoping might happen is I'll be able to come in here and mow this field, take this standing wheat, drop it onto the ground. Um, the buckwheat seed will be there. The sunflower seed will be there. I may need to put herbicide in here. I don't know, but so far I'm using no herbicide at all. Um, and have a place for doves. Uh, so that'd be kind of fun. I've got two or three other fields, so if this works, terrific. If it doesn't work, well, that's okay too. Uh, at the very least, what I'll get out of it is I'll have uh, the, the buckwheat and the sunflowers will provide a great environment for pollinators and for beneficial insects. Because what you can't see is immediately joining this field, separated by a drainage ditch, is another 10 acre field that I have planted in my um, summer legume mix. So we're going to go take a look at that in just a second. But for now, there's a couple of other things about this field that I think are worth showing just to kind of show some of the long-term strategies I have for this field. And uh, if you look right here, I have about 20 or 25 Dunstan chestnut trees uh, that line the east side and the north side of this field. Uh, so I've got it lined there with Dunstan chestnuts. And then uh, what you, what we'll go take a look at right now very quickly is to the west um, of the field, I've got a row of apple and pear trees. So let's go take a look at them right now and uh, see what they look like. And then I'm going to crawl back in the tractor, finish drilling this field. And once I've finished, we'll, uh, we'll take some time and go look at some of the fields I planted earlier this month, see how they're doing, and, and talk a little bit of philosophy. But let's look at some fruit trees first. So we're over on the west side of the field, and uh, as I mentioned, we have it lined with apple trees and pear trees. Uh, you can see an apple tree right here. I don't know how well it shows up, but it's absolutely loaded with apples. Next to it's a pear tree. So just one more thing to kind of create a, a neat environment, a neat ecosystem here. And with this field being in full bloom with the buckwheat and the uh, sunflowers, as I mentioned, there's going to be all kinds of insects in there. And now if you'll pan to the west a little bit, you can see that uh, this field is adjacent to a summer legume field, only divided by or separated by a drainage ditch. So um, we'll take a close look at that field after I finish planting the field that we're in right now. And uh, uh, for now, I'm going to go crawl up in the tractor and, and get a little work done. Let's go see what we can make happen. finished planting the uh, buckwheat field that's adjacent to this field right here and I thought it'd be fun to take a little bit of a tour and see what all we can find, see how the stuff's uh, growing that we planted earlier this year. So it's uh, June 2nd and we planted this field the first week of May, so a little less than a month. Now the first thing you're going to notice is that uh, the buckwheat has already come up and gone to bloom. It's an amazing plant, and I'm becoming a bigger fan of it all the time. Uh, it's the first thing up, grows really well, does a great job with the soil. 
um, deer eat it, which you know, I'm learning to uh, that that, that uh, happens every year. That's kind of a neat thing. About 12 or 13 percent protein on the uh, on the buckwheat, and it also tends to protect the other things that I've planted. So very symbiotic with the rest of the cultivars that I have in here. So let's take a closer look at some of the other things that are growing here and see what we can learn. Hello, Tessa. Uh, we can learn that our dog sure likes it up in this field. So the first thing I see right here, well, let's, here we go. There's a small sun hemp plant. Uh, we can zoom in on that sun hemp. I see another one over there. I'll go try to pluck it. Uh, the sun hemp uh, will get to be eight, ten feet tall, and once it gets hot, it's really going to take off and, and grow very well. Um, so, and, and it is the structure plant as much as anything else in this field. So, uh, it uh, the cowpeas will grow up it. Very happy about that. Uh, here's a sunflower. Uh, a lot of sunflowers in here. I planted three pounds to the acre of sunflowers, and they're all doing very well. So uh, the deer will eat them some. They'll also go to bloom, and uh, that'll attract insects as well. Uh, let's see what else we can find. Um, now, here's something interesting. Here's a fair amount of, uh, of radish, uh, another sunflower. Here's a fair amount of radish that's growing. Uh, that this is just volunteer. It was in here already uh, from the fall seeds and uh, it doesn't bother anything the sun will probably bake it it won't survive the summer but it's protecting some of the other plants that I have growing for example like this cow pea right here uh, there's a cow pea um, and by being protected the other things in this field there's a lot of ants you've got to watch your step carefully uh, so anyhow this cow pea is being protected now because I can assure you the deer love the cow peas and they'll eat them up uh, here's another one right here um, so with all of the things growing in here, the cowpeas are protected until they get a little bigger, and then they'll, they'll outrun the deer. Um, there's, here's another sun, sun hemp right here, but, uh, and here's an okra plant. I planted okra, that's new for my uh, mix this year. I planted it last year, was very happy with it. Uh, and, and surprisingly, the deer ate both the pods as well as the um, uh, leaves and limbs. Uh, Another sun hemp plant right here. There's uh, soybeans in here. That's something I'm looking for. Hadn't spotted one of them yet, but uh, I can assure you it's in here. Now, there's another thing to notice, and that is there's an awful lot of uh, just grass growing up in here. Doesn't bother me at all. Um, uh, I don't know if this is wheat or rye from the fall seed bank. Uh, I don't know if it's a native grass, but it doesn't matter. What I do know is it probably won't get much taller than that. And uh, once again, that's a different leaf structure. It's a different root structure. Uh, it'll do a great things for the soil. And the, my primary cultivars, the sun hemp, the cow peas, uh, the um, sunflowers, will all grow up above it. So it just creates a, a, a jungle in here, and that's one more part of the mix. I have two goals with these fields uh, that are worth talking about to go into philosophy a little bit. My first goal is to improve the soil. Uh, I want to do everything I can to have a diverse mixture of, of cultivars growing um, and uh, have as many root systems in there, as many leaf structures as possible to um, create a diversity that uh, I think improves the soil. It improves it by, both by its living uh, characteristics as well as the thatch whenever I terminate this in the fall. The second, uh, well, let me, go, let me stay with that for just a second because I think the other thing that's important is I never spray these fields. This field isn't sprayed, and as you can see, there's grass in it. If we were to look close, yeah, here's another okra. <laughs> if we were to look close, there's weeds growing up in here. Um, I'm more than willing to put up with that. And in fact, the deer eat some of the weeds, uh, uh, but I'm more than willing to tolerate weeds, grasses, because I know my cultivars will compete effectively for them. And as I've said before, I'm not a farmer. I'm not trying to get yield or profit. I'm trying to create healthy soil and grow big deer. So uh, by not spraying, it's well documented that spraying herbicides on a field uh, is negative for the microbiology of the soil. So I don't want to do that. What's not well documented, I've never seen anything about it, is I think by keeping the uh, nutritional plane as high as I do, um, and by not spraying poisons on things that deer eat, it is my personal belief that these deer live longer. 
they live longer and they live healthier. And in fact, uh, we're finding many of our best bucks that we're taking off of the farm are six, seven, eight years old. And, and I've got a whole bunch of deer that are in that age class that are even getting older. So it just stands to reason that if you can keep a deer healthier and have him live longer, there's more windows of opportunity for him to do something extraordinary. Um, and that doesn't even get into the advantages of having older age structures and the impact that has on, on the herd. I mean, it's fairly well proven that older mothers do a great job of mentoring their, uh, their children, teaching them how to survive in the wild. And I think the same is true for bucks as well. But enough of that soapbox. Uh, um, so let's look around a little bit more and see what else we can find. You know, here's something that's interesting. Uh, I'm seeing a fair amount of this right here. In fact, some of it is much bigger. We'll look at it as we get uh, into other parts of the field. There's a, a fair amount of um, either pearl millet or sorghum sudan grass that's growing in this field that was in last summer's mix. So those seeds survived the summer, they survived the winter, and uh, they're popping back up in here. But once again, I don't care. It's fine by me. They'll uh, just add to the uh, value of the field. Now, Lastly, there's uh, one last thing I'd like to get into, and that is one of the other values of having a diverse mix, and that is we're kind of up on a hill here. My fields are not agricultural fields. They're not uh, laser level. They're not in perfect shape. In fact, there's lower spots that hold water that are far uh, more moist, whereas up here it's a little sandier. Uh, it uh, drains better. As you can see, uh, the buckwheat does great here. So let's walk over to another spot in the field and take a quick look at a lower area and see how, uh, how that's performing with this mix. And again, there's always, with a broad mix, there's always something that will grow somewhere. So let's go take a look. Here we are in the same field, just in a different part of it. And the, uh, the first thing you're going to notice is no buckwheat blooming. And that's because this is a lower part of the field. It's uh, not as well drained. The soil tends to stay more moist. And come to find out, buckwheat doesn't like wet feet. But that's the advantage of having a diverse mixture is even with the buckwheat not doing well here, there are other things that are. So let's bend down and, and take a look at what all we have growing right here. First thing you notice is a sun hemp. Big fan of sun hemp. And uh, as it gets hotter, this stuff's going to grow like crazy. Um, so you got the sun hemp doing well in this part of the field. Here's a sunflower. You can see they're not as big as they were where it's better drained, but they're making it. They're doing all right. Um, here's a soybean. Uh, I bet if we walked all the way through this field very carefully, this is the size of soybeans we would find. Uh, it's just that up in the other area we were just in, it's harder to see the soybeans because there's so many other things growing. But they're still in there. They're doing fine. They're just more visible here. So they got sun hemp. We've got uh, uh, sunflower. We've got uh, soybeans. Um, Here's a cow pea. Got a cow pea growing. It's not uh, very big yet, but uh, uh, sometimes they can be slow to get started uh, and they'll take off. Uh, the other thing about this part of the field in particular is that um, a lot of deer come into the field. I'm only, uh, what, 15 or 20 yards from the edge of the woods, so the deer come in to here and, uh, you know, they're going to be hitting and grazing things pretty aggressively. So once again, uh, that's the value of having a diverse mix. Another value of having a diverse mix is no matter what's going on with the soil types in a field, something ought to grow. Now, before I leave these fields, there's one more thing I want to show you that uh, isn't about the fields, but uh, it is a lot about deer management. So let's go over here and take a look at something. I want to show you something. I'm on the woods line alongside the fields that we were just looking at, and uh, I wanted to show you another important element uh, that you'll notice no browse line. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the video, there's something growing 365 days a year in these fields that deer like. So obviously the deer are concentrated around here. I'm 50 yards away from a protein feeder right there, so the deer are going to be coming to that on a daily basis. And uh, 
One way that you can judge uh, the, the population of your herd is what kind of browse line you might have around your food plots. Now, again, some browse line is pretty normal, again, because the deer are concentrated around the food plots, but uh, it's something to keep an eye on. So let's walk along here and look at all the different plant species that are growing. I'll just point them out. I'm not going to dig in there too much because there could be a rattlesnake in here or a moccasin in here or a copperhead in here or a whole list of nasties that uh, I'm going to be fairly careful about, but uh, let's take a look and see what we can see. Um, first thing I notice is there's partridge pea growing all up in here. That's great for all kinds of wildlife. Uh, here's some ragweed. There's ragweed all up in here. Um, so it's doing pretty good. There's young oak sprouts all up in here. Uh, and just walking along, here's a blackberry vine. And as I look up in the, uh, the brush there, there's blackberries going, they're ripening right now. Here's an American beauty berry, or as we say in the South, French mulberry. Uh, deer will eat the, nip the nips in the fall some, uh, the, the tips of the plants in the fall some, and uh, birds like the berries. There's honeysuckle growing all up in here. Here's another oak sprout right here, and another oak sprout right here, and the deer like to eat that. But as you can see, they're not keeping up with the browsing. Sweet gum, absolutely worthless. I wish I could figure out a wild way to uh, um, march, uh, merchandise that, but it is what it is. And uh, here's something right here. If you'll look up in there, there's a muscadine vines. There's muscadines all through here. This is an 80-acre section of pines that uh, I burned last year, and it's turned into an absolute lush salad garden jungle. The whole 80 acres of it with muscadines and every kind of plant growing in there that you can imagine. Outstanding habitat. So uh, moving along, I don't know what this is right here, but the deer have been eating it. <laughs> here, I'll pull it up for you. Whatever that is, deer-like. I have been nipping it off a little bit, uh, uh, and more um, honeysuckle right here. And here is a plant. This is devil's walking stick. In fact, all this right in here is devil's walking stick. Uh, highly preferred plant in, in the south. The deer love it. Uh, they'll eat it when it's little. Um, but as you can see, this was all burnt to the ground last summer. It's come up this high and there's no way the deer can keep up with it. So that's just one more indicator that the population is under control. It's uh, um, a critical part of management and something that you can keep an eye on uh, in your own properties as you look at the, the timber line around your fields and see, is there a browse line? And if so, you might want to pay attention to your population. And if not, congratulations. So now with that in mind, let's go look at another experiment that I'm kind of excited about. Let's go. So here's the experiment I was talking about. Uh, this is about a three acre field that I planted this past fall in small grains as well as uh, Balanza fixation clover, crimson clover, chicory, and Louisiana S1. Um, obviously the Balanza and the crimson are gone. The chicory is all up in here. It's a little ch uh, uh, chicory growing all through here. Got a real good stand of it. And now it's down to just the Louisiana S1. So just on a chuckle, a couple of weeks ago, I came in here and drilled some Laredo forward soybeans into this. And um, as you can see, they're doing quite well. Uh, they're young yet, but they're doing quite well. Uh, and they're, uh, there's a good solid stand in the field. Um, the idea is behind all of that, that uh, if this is a typical Louisiana summer, it's going to get really hot. It's going to get dry towards the end of the summer. And at some point in time, the uh, Louisiana S1 clover will start to thin out, maybe even go completely dormant by the end of the summer. Whereas the Laredo soybeans, the forage soybeans, I understand they grow all the way to a frost and they, they should get up pretty tall. I don't think they'll choke the uh, clover out. In fact, I'm relatively sure it won't, but uh, they'll complement it very nicely. So the forage soybeans will last all the way to the frost. Now, sometime around October, uh, late September, early October, I'll come in and drill small grains right back into this again so that there'll be something growing in this field almost year round. The crimson and uh, balance fixation, of course, grow early. And then uh, the Louisiana S1 on up into the summer. And now the forage soybeans, the chicory will be in here for years. It's a great, uh, a great crop and very complimentary to all this. So just one more way that we can keep something growing in this field all the time. 
Which brings me back to philosophy. Uh, we'll move the camera now. <clears throat> I want to go up the hill and take uh, a little more video of this area <clears throat> and show how we manage these food plots so that there's always a compliment, complimentary, <coughs> excuse me, a complimentary uh, growth screen taking place and um, something growing 365 days a year. Follow me. The field we were just in is at the end of that gap down there, the, the far end of this field, the little gap to the right. Just beyond that, that's a creek that comes across. Just beyond that is the three acre field that we were just in that had the uh, Laredo soybeans. Now the philosophy that I wanted to talk about is the fact that uh, I believe it's valuable to have a wide variety of cultivars available for the deer, all within easy reach at any point in time. So with that in mind, what we have here, that field, as we just discussed, had um, LAS1, uh, the Balanza Fixation, uh, Crimson, uh, and now the uh, Laredo soybeans. And the field right here, that is all joint vetch, which I'm a big fan of joint vetch, as anyone knows that's watched these videos. So there's about three acres of joint vetch right there that's up and growing. And it will, it's slow to get started, but uh, towards July, August, it really gets going strong and it will do really well and deer absolutely love it. Now, just as a habitat feature, you'll notice right here, I leave an edge that's probably 40 or 50 yards wide between the field and the, uh, and the woods. It's just growing up in wild stuff. Uh, I do that one to create a sense of protection. The deer can walk out of the woods and uh, look around and be somewhat concealed. Also, it creates a kind of a wild forage food plot. There you can see a protein feeder. And right there is about an acre of red clover that I mowed uh, earlier in the year. And I'm experimenting with that mowing. I was able to do that before I was worried about fawns or anything else. And this being a well-drained hill, uh, I could get in it and uh, mow it without uh, uh, it rutting it up or anything like that. So you can see that there. And then on this side of the road, um, I didn't mow it. But underneath all that, that's mostly wheat and... Uh, radishes and turnips that have all bolted and they've gone to seed so yeah you don't have much you can't see the clover that's in there but there's a lot of clover in there and all together this is four or five acres and that just uh, when we get around here you can see the red clover growing a little better there you go so this all creates a habitat <clears throat> that again is diverse a lot of different cultivars growing there's red clover here also have some durano in this field chicory in this field and um, uh, as well as a lot of wild things uh, the, there's ragweed and uh, other things that the wild uh, plants that the deer will eat so all good stuff and it's just one more way to create a diverse habitat that uh, uh, really is attractive to the deer now that in mind let's move down to a clover field and um, I'll show you uh, the clover field in the first of June. I've talked a lot about the value of uh, doing blends and mixes with summer annuals with uh, the cowpeas and soybeans, sun hemp, sunflowers and so forth. Well the same is true with clover fields. Uh, I'm in about a 10 acre clover field here and what you see here is arrow leaf. Uh, now this arrow leaf I planted probably five years ago and it's predominantly arrow leaf it's, and it's taken over. Um, also, it has been mowed. This entire field looks like it's been run with a weed eater. But also in this field you can see here is some uh, crimson clover. It's kind of dried out some but uh, and gone to seed. In March or April, this entire field was a solid, beautiful red flower of crimson clover. It was just amazing. Then when the crimson clover died off, the arrow leaf came up and the red clover came up. In fact, here's a, a little red clover right here. You can see the traditional flower. But here's a uh, other variety. Here's the other value, if I might will, the other value of doing a variety. If you look down there, you'll see that the arrow leaf, uh, uh, it kind of fades out as you get down the hill into poorly drained soil, wetter soil, and harder soil, and that's where the Durano is. And so all of the whole bottom of this field is Durano clover, while the top on the hillside is the arrow leaf and the uh, red clover, along with the crimson. Well, the crimson was all over, so it makes a good combination, and uh, again, 
a diversity of clovers that uh, uh, match the soil type and um, now, frankly are available most of the year. Now I will also come in in the fall like with all of these fields and, and drill small grains into it. So the small grains will be in here uh, until they go to seed. So great combination. There's one more thing I have to show you. You know, I can't ever let the good enough uh, leave it alone. So let me show you one more thing you're going to kick out of and then uh, we'll call this video a wrap. So the top of the, this field, the top ridge of this field is very sandy and not much grows here. I'll get some clover and some small grains growing in the very best part of the year, but as it gets hot and dry, nothing's going to grow. So uh, Friday, I came in and mowed it very low, bush hogged it down as tight as I could, and uh, I brought my buckwheat blend in here. 30 pounds of buckwheat, 5 pounds of... Uh, of uh, sunflowers and I thought that'd be very pretty to have those flowers blooming up here on top as well as uh, uh, maybe get some sunflowers. Maybe they'll make it. Probably the deer are going to eat it but maybe they'll make it and uh, I'll just add one more little feature to this field. Of course you can see the protein feeder back there. Yeah, protein feeder, clover, sunflowers, buckwheat. Ah, good stuff. Let's see if we can't grow some deer with this. So that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll come back uh, this Louisiana farming in June 2nd. And uh, we'll come back a little later in the summer and take another look. Thanks for watching.